this week on the Back Table Podcast. And on my way to the airport with Stuart Reuter, his wife, I, I mentioned to him that I said, it's a great idea. Obviously, he has the problem of he, uh, you cannot control the possibility of uh, abrupt closure. So obviously, you need to use something to hold the artery open. Mm. And he just like, you know, right off, he said, good idea, work on it. Nah. He said, write it up and send me a report. Oh, that's... Oh, anyway, that's why Stuart was... That's a good the, mentor. That's a good mentor He was mentor an excellent right mentor with an instinct out of his world, yeah. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Innovation Podcast. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. This is our next installment in the Backtable Innovation Show, where you will hear stories from physician entrepreneurs who are helping to drive healthcare forward through medtech innovation. This is Brian Hartley as your host this week. I'm a radiologist living in Silicon Valley and co-founder of an early stage medical device company in the pulmonary space. So Dr. Julio Palmas is our guest today. He's one of the most well-known interventional radiologists in the world for his groundbreaking development of the balloon expandable stent in the 80s. His patent for the Palmas stent was recognized in Intellectual Property Magazine as one of the 10 patents that changed the world in the last century. He's currently on faculty at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. He's also still innovating to develop tomorrow's medical devices. Thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Palmas, and welcome. Thank you. So I was hoping we could start off by you just telling us uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, where are you from? Where'd you train? Where do you live? All right. I currently spent about half my time in the Napa Valley and the other half in San Antonio, Texas. Beautiful. Yeah, it's actually a good combination. I am originally from Argentina and I came here. Actually, I came to California as if I was my port of entry in the 70s. And uh, I trained in, in radiology uh, mm -hmm. at the University of California, Davis. Okay. And, and then I spent all my, I'm sorry, not all of it, but mm -hmm. most of my career in the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. Okay, that's, that's great. So I actually, I lived in Argentina for about three months during medical school doing research in, in RSV, the neonatal virus beautiful country lived in buenos aires and it's just a fantastic place to be yes it is uh we ended up traveling to mendoza the wine country there and that is also another amazing place so i was hoping to hear a little bit what are some of the differences between practicing ir in argentina versus the united states and also any training differences that you that you've noticed well you know i <laughs> Most of the interventional radiology developed when I was outside of Argentina. You know, at, at that time when I was in Argentina training, there was no such a thing of interventional radiology. It was uh, mostly angiography. It was, mm. you know, angiographic diagnosis by images. And of course, you know, needle biopsies and embolizations and all those things started coming out, but uh, the name had not been invented yet. Okay. Yeah, I guess that, that makes sense. So why did you decide to come to the U.S. around that time? Well, I mean, in Argentina, you can do teaching and, and medical practice very nicely and uh, probably be a satisfying professional life. But, but research definitely is something to be desired there. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, definitely, I, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to develop something and um, I came to the States with that idea in mind. So you knew you wanted to be an innovator even at that time? Yeah, I, mean, I was inspired by certain people and uh, following people in the literature and their mm -hmm. developments. And radiology was going so fast at those, those days. And it was so exciting that I want to be part of that, act, that action. And, yeah. Uh, and that was the reason why I decided to come. Okay. What, what, was there anybody in specific, anybody specifically that you were following in the journals that inspired you? Yeah, that's good. I, I did actually, uh, Stuart Reuter, who ended up being my mentor, uh, my lifetime mentor, but Joe Buchstein, Helen Redman, Manuel Viamonte at the time were among those that, you know, were uh, people to watch. We were publishing a lot. The, 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 their publications were very innovative and very challenging and, uh, and, you know, I, 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 I really, I, 
actually, I would have applied to train with any of those. And, you know, Dr. Reuter picked me up. No, that's great. And we're glad he did. And what, so what was your first real innovation project? Something that you thought that you took on as your own, you know, that you wanted to develop? Well, you know, I, uh, there was a a period where I had, I came to visit Dr. Reuter and meet him personally and the, uh, you know, the uh, University of Michigan hospitals first in 1973, I believe. And um, so I I, I didn't have an intention at the time to come to the United States. I, I wanted to develop in Argentina and I had several projects. I was fascinated by microangiography mm-hmm. and um, I developed actually a rotating grid to Im- improve resolution, you know, at some millimeter level. And um, so wow. I came up with a contraption that was essentially a pneumatically activated uh, rotating grid. There was one actually being sold at the time, mm-hmm. but it was uh, very small. It, it was actually for animal, you know, mm-hmm. animal models. Uh, I wanted to make one for use in patients. And uh, so I developed one that was uh, a four centimeter diameter. So it was a larger contraption. And so that was actually one of my first projects in radiology. Wow. And what, what is microangiography specifically? What were you looking for? Well, I mean, they, at that time, I mean, it's amazing how the, the, the trends change. Mm-hmm. At that time, the goal was to see, you know, with higher definition. Mm-hmm. You wanted to see uh, small vessels so you could tell whether they were neoplastic or not. And, mm-hmm. and you know, you want to see with greater detail, atherosclerotic lesions. And, and the, for that, you needed to go with, you know, special x-ray tubes with microfocal spots, you know, 0.3 millimeter and so mm-hmm. on. And that put an enormous challenge in the heat loads of the tubes, as you know. Right. And uh, so, and then you had to use very brief exposure times. And, mm-hmm. and so for that, you need, you know, big uh, amperage in, in, in the uh, transformers. And so essentially, uh, you know, a, an experimental and geographic lab was rather special. And it was being developed, but, you know, uh, in, by 1971, 72, 73, that, all that was not widely available. Okay, interesting. And so this was mainly lab-based work that you were, you were performing? No, actually, I introduced it into my uh, geographic lab. Oh, then. So when I was in Argentina in, 70, in the early 70s, I, I eventually took over the university angio lab. So I was performing their angiographic procedures. That's what I did. So when we get to the part of, you know, what is my basic training, you're going to think that is a little crazy, but that's the way it was those days. Oh, uh, well, continue. I don't want to stop you. Yeah, I mean, there. that's exactly the point. You know, I, you know, the, the programs of, of the, the educational programs were not well organized. There were no board exams. Hmm. <clears throat> what you did at the time was, you know, you essentially hanged up, hang around a professor, mm-hmm. somebody that was, you know, well-known and, and, you know, had a following of people like me at that Mm -hmm. time. And, but uh, there was no board certification, no Mm -hmm. board certified programs and so forth. Like a preceptorship Uh, almost. So, and uh, to a certain extent, it was the same thing in Europe because I did look prior to deciding to come to the States, I looked into Switzerland and I, uh, Zurich, and I looked into Melbourne, Australia and, uh, and uh, Canada. And uh, so the, at that time, in North America, there, there was, there was a, you know, already organized teaching programs for residencies, in other mm-hmm. words, and fellowships. And quickly, the, the certification boards and all that, they were coming out. But, but I, actually, it was the beginning of all this. You know, in Argentina, obviously, a few years after I left, they did have them too, but not at the time. So it was pretty much a European style. You hang up hang around the professor. That's mm-hmm. essentially it is. And you spend longer than you would in a radiology, in a, in a residency program. So you sort of learn by osmosis type of situation more. That's correct. I mean, you would go, you know, you do, of course, 
the morning rounds and then the review sessions and all that. I mean, it's pretty much in the end what we do here, but it was a little bit up to you to get educated. So you you have to buy your journals and and you know and the books and and read and get educated so that you know the professor will ask you a question. You know it, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so you've you were already finished with training by the time you came to the United States. Is that correct? Well, okay, it was an informal training. You know, I, I remember my early conversations with Dr. Reuter. And he couldn't believe my education was so discombobulated that <laughs> I had three years of nephrology. Wow. And, um, and then I, uh, you know, essentially I hanged around a couple of surgeons that were doing angiographic procedures in, and that's what I did also for a few years. Uh, so by... 1975, I was really, I didn't have really a specialty. I just have an interest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I always want to do research. For example, when I was doing nephrology, I I was uh, studying uh, immune electrophoresis of the urinary proteins. And that was my, wow. that was my gig. And then when I uh, essentially discovered catheterization and angiographic procedures, I totally fell in love with that. And that's what I decided to do. But again, I, I didn't have a formal education. So I remember Stuart told me, I mean, you're nothing. <laughs> you're <laughs> not trying. <laughs> so I said, I'm a little old to get into a residency now. <laughs> and he said, yeah, but you have to do it. Otherwise, you know, forget it. And um, so, you know, he just started his own radiology program in a new in, and he, which was a, in a satellite hospital to University of California, Davis, where he was the vice chairman. And I became the first resident of that program. So, I, 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 I mean, it was, you know, a pleasure doing it. You know, I was already a little bit older and, you know, and I, everything, you know, was pleasurable for me to, mm -hmm. to, to study. And um, so, and, you know, that program was essentially, I... He, he, you know, he was essentially traveling around. I, yeah. I remember going to uh, Children's Hospital in Oakland, and then mm -hmm. I would spend Wednesdays at UCSF, where we, uh, you know, I participated in, every, in all the neuroradiology activities that day. And so, you know, so we were we were, tra were traveling around. The big, so it was a bit of a... gave me a great exposure, you know, to everything. Absolutely. It sounds like a kind of a patchwork of training from different institutions. Uh, correct. Correct. And you were wow. mentioned that you had IR. <laughs> yeah. The IR week. I, I did that. At, yeah. At UC Davis and Sacramento, the medical center. <laughs> I used to do that too. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. So, okay. So what time, what time frame are we here with your training? Uh, that was 1977, 78. Okay, gotcha. So when it's around this time, I assume that uh, you were working with uh, angi you were working with catheters, angiography, and so tell us when when you started thinking about the idea for the stent. Where was angioplasty at the time? So you know, Stuart uh, was great. You know, I, I did you know a, a radical change in my life, in my family's life by coming here. So obviously, I was I had no time to waste, and Stuart, you know. Noticed that I had an interest in academia, and I said, "Okay, I I, I love the academic life. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I, I I love writing papers. I mm -hmm. you know, I love to teach and all that, and doing research in a lab. I thought all that fit me really well. So, um, you know, I, you know, Stuart said, "Okay, yeah, he, you know, he said you need to write papers. Is is your currency to mm -hmm. progress?" And you will have to, you know, essentially, it's publish or perish. And he explained mm -hmm. me all the, you know, all about it. And uh, so, and he said, you're already old. And I was in my <laughs> mid-30s, you know. But <laughs> oh, that's not good for me then. An old man. <laughs> and he said, so you're going to start writing papers and doing research right during your residency, which, you know, added one more task to my mm -hmm. list. And, uh, and I, yeah, we, I wrote a couple of papers with him. I helped him put them together. And then he said he was uh, president of the uh, SCVIR that year. Okay. So what do you, yeah. And um, the, okay. he said, we have a, a 
a guy that I want you to listen to. Uh, he's a young man uh, about your age. He said, the name is Andres Grunsdig. And he's going to be our keynote speaker this year. So I want you to come. Mm. And, and it was first year resident. And, wow. Uh, so it was in New Orleans. And so I, I, I went to New Orleans uh, for my first time in New Orleans. And, you know, fair enough, angry Andres Grunsdig was a speaker the last day of the program at the last hour. So it mm. was a Friday afternoon. The program was over. It's been a, a week program and uh, his talk was the last. And uh, so you had to be committed to be there, you know? I was scary to say, I don't know if they do that anymore. A lot of people are, are was taking true. off they by that to point. keep the audience in place. You know? Ah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Did it so, work? Was, was it a packed house? Yes, he was. He was. No, no, yeah. Definitely. Uh, it was my first, uh, it was my first American meeting, really. And, uh, and it was uh, the annual meeting of the CBIR, not bad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Andre, Andre Scrooge was the keynote speaker. Wow. So, I mean, it, you started pretty high. <laughs> I, I, I was, yeah. I, I was totally amazed at mm -hmm. everything, you know. So I, you know, I, I went to the room and I sat there about 10 minutes before it started. Then I got this center seat in the front. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then my steward came in as a president. He introduced him and, and he gave his talk. And, you know, I mean, the, the experience of listening to Andreas Grunstig presenting his first, I think he had four or five cases of angioplasty at that time. Mm. Because he did his first one, I believe, in 77 by November, December. And, and he and this meeting was uh, February of 78. Wow. <laughs> so pretty, he, he was an impressive guy, I had to admit. Uh, I mean, I was totally, I mean, I was totally impressed by him. Mm -hmm. And so he was talking about angioplasty. Was the room receptive to it did you did you did you immediately say this is this is going to be the future of endovascular yeah i mean he 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 got a standing ovation which you know for the, the quality of people that was filling the room at mm -hmm. that time was pretty impressive uh, no i mean andres was a star from the time go i mean mm -hmm. there was no question about it i mean he he had a great personality he was totally at ease his english was almost perfect and he was a great lecturer and he was honest and that that came through listening to him right off he honest. for example you know he presented these four cases never you know he he never oversold the project you know he he's you know he pointed at all the problems and potential risks right off the beginning you know and in fact he had a few pathological slides of people that had died and uh, I don't remember, yeah, as a consequence of the, of the procedure, I think one of them was, and the other one was an autopsy, but one way or the other, he did show quite a bit of pathology and, 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 you know, what the balloon did to the arteries, you know, the delamination and the subintimal hemorrhage and the transfer of, you know, the, the uh, you know, through the wall cracks and things like that. It was, uh, you know, it was like, watch it. I mean, this. I mean, he's a very promising thing, but he's dangerous too. And, yeah. Uh, it, it's amazing that he knew so much about it, that, that so much had been learned in such a short period of time. You know, he was already talking about standby surgery, you know, and that was going to be a big like, ooh. I mm -hmm. mean, if you're going to have a whole team, you know, with, you know, the heart lung machine and everything standing by. <laughs> yeah, that's a big standing deal. Standing by means you need to have everything primed and right. everything ready to go. And uh, that is a big limitation. But then he spent a lot of time talking about the pump that would inflate the balloon, which actually was never used. And nobody used it. I mean, everybody was at uh, that time later on using a simple syringe and then the manometer. But but he had this contraption that was foot operated and things like that. And, to achieve higher pressures? Well, I mean, the, the pressure limits were very low. I mean, oh. at that time, it was three, four atmospheres because these things were PVC, you know? Mm -hmm. He made them out of IV tubing. Oh, wow. Well, the, the, pro, the initial prototypes. Uh, but yeah. I think, actually, they used PVC for quite a while. Mm -hmm. When did you look at... Uh, when would, did restenosis come in as a 
as a potential problem. Did he talk about that at all there? Or when did you kind of think about this idea of? No, I mean, huh. I, I, I really don't remember. I okay. mean, he presented so few cases and mm -hmm. it was so, I mean, a few months since his first experience, I can't believe that he would have seen restenosis. Yeah, right, right. Like, Unless it was in animals or something like that, but who knows? I think it was mostly related to elastic recoil. Okay. And acute, you know, closure. Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so what did you... Well, I mean, it's interesting, you know, as I said, you know, I did have the idea. I mean, he was so explicit with all his images and his um, description of the problems of delamination and, and subintimal hemorrhage and all the things that, you know, I mean, I, I always wonder if there was somebody else that thought of using some kind of internal support. Mm -hmm. at the time, but I did come out and on my way to the airport with Stuart Reuter, his wife, I, I mentioned to him that I said, it's a great idea. Obviously, he has the problem of he, uh, you cannot control the possibility of uh, abrupt closure. So obviously, you need to use something to hold the artery open. Mm. And he just like, you know, right off, he said, good idea, work on it. No. Nah. He said, write it up said, and send me a report. Oh, that's. Oh, anyway, yeah, that's why Stuart was. That's a good mentor. That's a good mentor. He was mentor an excellent right mentor with an instinct out of his world. Yeah. And we, uh, we spoke with another interventional radiologist recently who, who mentioned we were talking about the importance of having people around you that say, that encourage you, that say your ideas, you know, people that say, yes, let's try to do this. Let's take it to the next level rather than having, you know, people around you that'll, that'll detract or say, oh, that's never going to work. Uh, and how important that is to so many innovations. Yeah, right. I mean, obviously, you know, Stuart was also an educated part of it. So, you know, he knew, yeah, he recognized a good idea and uh, that, that was Part of it, not he was just not trying to make me in like a successful academician, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, good, good mentors are very, very important, and that was uh, Dr. Arvin Arapali who we were uh, speaking with recently. Uh -huh. um, but okay, so we're it's a great idea. He he tells you to write it up. What did you do at this point? Well, how did you prototype? Well, I mean, I I I did. I I, I was actually you know very applied, you know, and, you know, <laughs> had my family there and I right. was not fooling around. Very motivated. Uh, so right on, I started, you know, setting up, I made, I had a little workbench in my garage and I got myself a magnifying glass and some materials to start working. And, um, you know, the balloons at that time were not commercially available, but Boston Scientific at that time, Meditech, was already at announcing that they were going to be available pretty soon. So, of course, we signed up for, for balloons. And in a few months later, I, 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 we were doing procedures and then I got some, maybe, maybe it was several months later. And, and then I was, you know, cleaning them up and, and taking them to my house to play with them. So, you know, by that time, I would say maybe about eight months or mm -hmm. 10 months later, I started playing with meshes and, and, and balloons and rubber tubes. And, and then, well, I mean, then the, the, the rest is, uh, you know, but by 24 months, I already had done a pretty good research of the whole literature. Mm -hmm. No, whatever was written, which were not many papers actually, and um, I had read a little bit about metals and metal implants, and uh, and I already had gone through the iterations of the device itself. I mean, how it was going to work to maintain plasticity. The cross points of the mesh had to be welded, otherwise the thing will be not. It wouldn't have a memory. Where did you get the idea for the welding or the, uh, the cross points? A trial and error. So, you know, in the beginning I, I did it without, and then the mesh did not have any memory. It was fairly elastic. And then it would just collapse. I, it wouldn't actually be flimsy. I mean, it wouldn't do anything. No radio but then force. When you, when you weld the points, then it would have a memory. Then you could essentially collapse it around a, a folded balloon. 
and then blow up the balloon, the thing will go to the diameter of the balloon and stay there when you deflate the balloon. And this was okay. And, and did you use your welding together separate pieces of metal at this point? I would weld it. No, I would weave it into a single wire mm -hmm. going back and forth between pins in and out, uh, at each, at each uh, cross point. And then once the whole thing was together, then I would, you know, I mean, I would use copper to do this, you know, because it was easier to use and then the easier to weld too. I mean, just using solder. Mm -hmm. Wow. I knew that that was not going to be adequate for implantation. You know, I, by then I knew that I had to, to use some sort of a solder and stainless steel, the solder that none of the solders that, that we could use on the stainless steel actually were biocompatible. And then I made the iteration of going to a tube with the stagger slots so that I wouldn't have to use wire. I mean, then I made it, they came up with the idea of a single piece device with the stagger slots. And so that was a single tube that you would actually cut out pieces. Right. Uh, you know, it was kind of a funny, I always tell this story. I mean, mm -hmm. in my garage, they were making, a mason was making a, a little cubicle for the wash and dryer and, mm -hmm. and he was using expanded metal and lath, mm. um, you know, lath and plaster. And mm -hmm. so he left a piece of, of that material on the floor and, and I picked it up and, and I started looking at it. I said, wow, I mean, this is a mesh without, you know, that will retain memory and mm -hmm. will not have solder. And uh, so I started pulling it out and pushing it in and realized that the diamond, staggered diamonds were staggered slots when you push it in. And, and then I said, this could be a, a single tube where you had to cut these slots. And of course, then all the technical issues about doing that in a microscopic device, you know, came up, but, you know, so I, yeah, I, after playing a lot with those things and making little models and things that I decide why I'm going crazy trying to use little stuff, mm -hmm. I could make this like a hundred times larger and then I can do all my calculations about, you know, uh, free area versus metal area and mm -hmm. how that changes with expansion and all those things in large models. And I started working with cardboard and that was actually a, a good solution. So I figured out somehow all the simple geometries and, you know, the, you know, how the, the expanded area would change with increasing diameters. And, you know, there, there were a few geometry, simple geometry calculations that can, could be made. Mm -hmm. You know, how the, the slot length actually influenced the radial strength and things like that. Wow. So yeah. you're inspired by a mason. That's a, kind of an incredible story. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, shows, it shows how, uh, it shows how it, kind of this cross disciplinary, you know, being able, being open to things that are not immediately within the realm that you're working in. Obviously, none of this had been seen in medicine, but people had probably been using it for a long time for, for other applications, or at least the shape, the general idea to inspire. I think it's incredible. Yeah, it was a lucky shot. Well, the, you know, luck is, is preparation, right? And you were, <laughs> you were, you were, per, you were very prepared. You were very prepared. And I can tell you also, you had the mind to go deep into the science. Hearing when, you talk, you were not afraid of going into areas that, you know, had never been explored before. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive how far you can go on a theory basis, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have to really have practical steps in between to move on to the next, to the next problem. I mean, mm -hmm. you can go quite a long time on an empirical basis, you know. And you have to convince it, yourself, I guess. That's really what you have to convince. Uh, yeah, like uh, uh, but, but all the things that are pretty, pretty they are, you know, make sense from the science point of view, for, mm -hmm. you know, things like, for example, things that are not going to be biocompatible or they may pose a problem. You know, the minute that you start reading and what is in the literature about metal implants and dissimilar metal corrosion and all mm -hmm. those things, I mean, it's all there. You just have to apply it to your needs. And synthesize you know? it. Yeah. 
Wow. Incredible. So you, so you're working on this. Tell me at this point, you've got a good idea what can work you. How long have you been working on it? And when did you decide that this could be a commercial entity and this should be used in patient care more importantly? And tell me about that process to try to yeah. try to scale it and move, move it to patient care. Right. You know, obviously, you know, again, I, you know, honestly, I never thought of a company. I never thought of essentially make it into a commercial success or my only interest was at that point, the academic, you know, so, mm-hmm. and to me, the success, the, the goal would be to have it made essentially adopted by a company and be made, mm-hmm. you know, and at that time. You know, it, it, there was a lot of devices that had names of the people that have described them and then were made by a company. Right. I mean, I, 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 there's lots of examples. You know them well. Mm. Uh, so Greenfield uh, f- Cable Filter, for example. Yeah. One of oh, them, yeah. yeah. So the thing was then to me, uh, the possibility to attract a company to do it, you know, based on all the drawings and my little prototypes and things like that. And so my... And then, you know, I tried to uh, actually, I talked to, let me see, I spent three years actually, you know, proposing to companies, then the companies will show initial interest. And then uh, a while later, somewhere between months to a year, would come and say that they were not interested. Wow. And I have great letters, you know, uh, (laughs) from those people saying that. Some of them said that the implantation of metals in the vascular system is is, is not a possibility and that they wow. will never happen. And so, you know, pretty interesting. Did you keep the letters? Of course, yes, I have them, yeah. So, but, you know, I, I, I say I, I did that exercise three times with three mm-hmm. companies and they made me sign contracts and things like that and then eventually mm-hmm. sent me a letter saying that they were not interested. Interesting. So, you know. At that time, you know, I was not doing much with the project other than, you know, keep on reading, essentially getting educated in the whole issue of, you know, I was doing angioplasties myself at that time and, mm-hmm. and, and learning more and more about it. And of course, at that time, which you mentioned, restenosis was already something that was well known. Okay. And uh, the, the interesting thing is there's something, something really, uh, there, there was a turning point was meeting a, um, a, a biotechnology technician from, from Stanford, retired from Stanford. His name was Werner Schultz. Mm-hmm. And one of the companies that showed no interest in the same conversation where they told me that they were not going to pursue anything like this, they gave me the name of this person. He said, maybe that person can work with you. Mm. And um, so... Uh, the following day, I was at this person's house, and that was, uh, I remember it was in Willits, California, way north. And I remember I just had bought the used Porsche 911, put my daughter in the back, my wife on the front, and we've, we, we did the, uh, the maiden trip of the car to Mr. Schultz's house. Uh, wow. Um, so I, he, yeah. he was a very interesting person. He was an older man, white hair, heavy German accent, his mm-hmm. wife, same. And, um, look at my uh, papers and drawings and things like that and said, yeah, there are many ways that you can do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was talking about the slotted, slotted stent mm-hmm. and he said, at least I have six different possibilities for you. <laughs> and I wow. said, wow. I mean, it's amazing. I've been That's probably good to hear. After. Waiting for three years or yeah. somebody come up with a way to do it. And this guy <laughs> has six different ways. Wow. And, um, and he was, you know, incredibly well-versed on all this. And, and I, so I, he had shown me his lab before. And in the lab, he was making micro needles for manipulation of nuclear material in cells. And Wow. And the guy was very, very excellent, you know, whatever he did with tools and micro tools and things like that. So what, and he was uh, talking about laser and the laser was, uh, you could hear some about some things about it, but the, the, the laser cutting was not in the horizon. Mm-hmm. All right. He, he already said, 
that that was one of the ways that this could be done, which eventually became, you know, what we are using today. But he mentioned also EDM and he used, you know, water jetting and, and, and stamping and he was going, it, nuclear bombardment. And, I mean, it went on and on. And, uh, and I said, okay, well, can you do this for me? And he said, no, no, I don't. No, no. Uh, yeah. Because I'm retired, he said, you know. But he said, but have it, have it done. And I said, yes, it's easy to say where. <laughs> he said, I, if I were you, i will do it with EDM. He said, it's probably the easiest way to do it. And I said, all right. And where is that? He said, well, just look in the yellow pages. And oh, said, my gosh. Gosh. Oh, yeah. no. I wasted all these. Of course, it's in the yellow pages. <laughs> right. So, yeah, I did look in the yellow pages. There were several shops. And about a week later, I was at one of them. Mm. All right. And yeah, fair enough. That was essentially the beginning. And eventually the person that did my first prototypes ended up had, having a contract with Johnson & Johnson to do some of the early commercial stents. So, you know, it's, it's, it was pretty amazing. But unfortunately, Mr. Schultz died two weeks after I met him. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, yeah. And that was so, it was almost like a signal to me. I mean, I, I mean, mm. I don't think I can go any further here in California mm. where I was nah, uh, my, because I didn't have a place that would offer me in academia mm -hmm. the time I needed to do all this. Right. And, and I tried, I tried UCSF and I tried the Stanford and, and of course, you know, with, with the credentials I had at the time, I just, I couldn't get what, you know, what I needed, yeah. uh, you know, they were very encouraging, but they wouldn't, couldn't give me 30%, 40% research time. Right. So, um, I, and Dr. Reuter, who had been trying to attract me to San Antonio ever since he had taken up that chair position in San Antonio. So he said, okay, mm -hmm. this is your cue. It's time for yeah. to come. <laughs> And um, so I that, that went to San Antonio and stayed there for 21 years. Wow. Uh, developed the whole thing there. So how did you get into the, first of all, how did you get your initial seed funding? Who were, who was involved there? Again, again, my dear mentor, I came in and he made me a loan from the department mm -hmm. and uh, which I eventually had to repay, but I, I, I had you know, a pretty generous budget and they had, mm. he gave me a research technician. He, he gave me an arrangement where I could do all the research uh, I wanted in the time I wanted, as long as the clinical the responsibility of chief Ange of angiography at the time uh, would be maintained, you know, in other mm. words, I had to take care of the, of my section. Right. And I, I did, I, I, I worked real hard. I mean, eventually got help and got organized and the beginning was not easy, but I had a research technician that helped me a lot and uh, then eventually had two, then three. And, and so, you know, things, things went well. Okay. Antonio. And tell me, when did you meet Dr. Dr. Schatz and Phil Romano? How does that, how did that story unfold? So I was about a year in there already, I uh, I was already fairly organized. I was um, even doing an animal model of uh, atherosclerotic aorta in rabbits using the balloon technique. And uh, so in this high cholesterol diet, rabbits and placing stents there. And so I would say probably at the time, I you know, I had a fair amount of work going on. Mm -hmm. I had published couple of papers and I had several on, on the process of being published. And, and so my research goes, was going well, but at that point I had uh, no, 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 nobody really interested in picking up, you know, commercial sponsorship. And nonetheless, my, my research was going excellent. I had a, a, a superb pathologist who developed a method of being able to plasticize extended vessels mm -hmm. and then cut them. And uh, the Dr. Furman Tio, and so it, he helped me a lot in that respect. And, you know, I, I had a lot of help. So uh, I was, um, um, at that point, I was owing a fair amount of money to the Department of Radiology. And, yeah. and, and Reuter was telling me, well, you need to get some sort of a, you know, support, NIH or something, uh, or, or VA. Or, so mm -hmm. I, I did apply. Mm -hmm. I applied 
you know, for a grant. I was at that time. I was into writing, uh, writing uh, applications to all these agencies, and part of my work trying to get sponsorship. I went to the Southwest Research Foundation in San Antonio, where they have a a, a big uh, colony of smoking baboons there, and a lot of work done in this in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met Dr. McGill, Henry McGill, who was the chief of the vascular section at that time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, showed, made a presentation to him of what, where I was at that time. And, mm -hmm. and, and he liked the project. And he said, but look, I mean, you need to get your money. money. He said, mm -hmm. we, we cannot support you here without you bringing money. Mm -hmm. So go get your NIH grant. Then you come back here, you know, and uh, we'll talk. So he said, by, by the way, there is another guy here that likes the subjects uh, of angioplasty and has done a little bit of work. And uh, his name is Schatz and, and uh, Richard Schatz. And, and he says, phone number is right here. So essentially, I left empty handed. Mm -hmm. called Richard that afternoon. And that evening, I met him. And uh, he saw the stents, which at that time I, were, I was already making them with EDM. And I had, coronary size tents. And, um, you know, he was enthusiastic beyond words. I mean, he said, this is fantastic. I mean, obviously I'd like to work with you and, and Richard, you know, we, started, you know, a friendship and actually a, a, an association, uh, that lasted for many years. Wow. Okay. So taking off from, you met Dr. Schatz and how did Phil Romano come into well the, the funny thing is so richard you know it uh, was very encouraging you know obviously i brought to him that i really had solved just about all my problems like uh, pathology and animal housing and everything but i needed funds essentially i was running out of money and um so richard about soon after we met he came back and he said, I met somebody that may be interested in investing in, in your project. And I, and that's what I, it was complicated because I didn't understand it. I mean, I said, private person and what, what is he expects? And he said, well, he will most likely form a company. And I said, oh, complicated. Um, hmm. I, I, I didn't know how to put together the fact that I was working as an associate professor in, at the university, and I was getting this guy's money and forming mm -hmm. a company. I just didn't see. Ethi it. Ethically, you were thinking, how does this work? Or what were you thinking? How was I, it? I, I don't even know if I went through the ethics of this mm -hmm. uh, in my mind. It's just that practically speaking, I didn't know how that could happen. Mm -hmm. And how did Dr. Schatz know Phil Romano? Oh, they were partners in golf, I guess, or tennis, uh -huh. something like that. Uh -huh. and, uh, so, um, you know, he came to visit me and he brought his lawyer, which gave me a little bit of a uh, uh, cold nervous. sweat. And now, who is, who, what is Phil Romano, just for our listeners, who is Phil Romano and what is he known for? Yeah, well, Romano, you know, at the time just had sold his, uh, you know, hamburger chain called Fuddruckers in San Antonio, and he was looking for an investment, actually. And he's a uh, serial developer of, of restaurants and, and other things, but he was very successful with restaurants. And Macaroni Grill, is that correct? That's so, right. At okay. my house and there's several other chains, and he always done well with restaurants. And um, so Phil proposed some sort of a... Like he didn't want to essentially... What I was proposing was, look, I mean, you put your money into my account mm -hmm. as a donor, mm -hmm. then I use the money and, you know, I, I really don't know. I cannot <laughs> explain to you what <laughs> you're gonna, how you're going to benefit from all this. And he said, look, I don't do business with the government. He said, yes. but I, I propose that we do a company right now, mm -hmm. I mean, between the three of us and, you know, shuts you and me and 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 then eventually we we will operate we pay royalties to the university and i say oh okay then the concept of royalties came up i mean which i never have thought any of no. these possibilities out you know mm -hmm. so you know but 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 he did start talking to the university and eventually the university was interested 
And uh, so eventually we ended up doing something like that in which a university would actually receive royalties and, uh, you know, expandable graft partnership, which EGP was the entity, you know, will operate as a private, as a private entity. And, uh, and, and this was before, to... this was before the, I guess the word is it the buy dole act, I guess that, that kind of gave universities ownership of certain patents and things. And, but, but, it... oh, well, but there, there was a little, a little detail. I applied to, to the University of Texas system patent office so that they would sponsor my patent mm-hmm. before I met Romano and the university rejected my patent. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So in fact, there were two applicants at the time. One had a rodent laryngoscope and mm-hmm. he got accepted and the stand got rejected. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Small detail. That's a very interesting detail. Right at the same time, the VA, I had, you know, career grants with the VA. Mm -hmm. So, and they rejected me too. Oh my gosh. You know, I, I, I was actually sometimes very discouraged. (laughs) Nobody likes a stand. I mean, what's wrong with these people? And how many years has this been at this point that you've been steadily see, making yeah, progress, yeah. de-risking it? I mean, that's what you were doing. We with... formed EGP in 85. So let me see. Seven, so, eight years or something that you've... Yeah, about, about that. Yeah. And, wow. Um, Talk about the perseverance you have to have and belief in the idea. Well, I mean, for some reason, people, it, it was... At that time, it was in the, the idea was actually very repulsive to a lot of people. The idea of putting a metal contraption in the coronary artery was not welcome, and and I think that's the reason because I otherwise a career investigator I had grants with the VA by that time for several years, and and they usually accept your grants. Well, they rejected me flat out. I mean, they didn't even give me the opportunity to come back. Wow. So, you know, with those two rejections, the university said, okay, well, then this obviously, you know, it is pretty evident that this thing is not going to work. So they took whatever we proposed. And um, so, yeah, that's pretty much. What that's unbelievable. And so you had some seed funding from uh, Phil Romano, you started Expandable Graph Partnerships. When did you approach J and J and Johnson and Johnson? Right. So uh, then Romano he started actually working pretty hard at trying to attract a sponsor, and um, and we had several companies, the Boston Scientific, Shiley Corporation. I think uh, a couple of companies that were not. Tradition in the catheter business, uh, can't remember right now, but mm-hmm. but eventually, you know, Shats again, you know, Shats, or we, we'd always told Richard has the crystal ball. He found out that Johnson & Johnson was looking for a way to get into the vascular business. Mm. And they had already purchased a company, an ultrasound company. I think it was, well, I, I can't remember who it was, but they wanted to uh, get into the vascular business. So he heard that through the grapevine. I mean, uh, actually, I remember when. I mean, he w- came to me. I was presenting for the third in a row or second in a row at, at the RSNA. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and Richard, you know, uh, went straight to the to the exhibits hall and and started looking around and talking with several companies and company representatives and and found. Eventually, the person from J and J that showed interest. That person came to San Antonio, and unlike the other companies, was very receptive from the time go. And and make a long story short, I mean, in in, in a few months, we had already an agreement, a licensing agreement with Johnson Johnson. Wow, they saw the the utility of it clearly, and they saw the potential. Uh, yes, and, I mean, and, uh, I mean, I, I tell you, it was a total departure in attitude from from the rest. I mean, after years and years of rejection from agencies and companies and things like that, here comes a company that you know s- saw it, and and the most important thing, they decided to pay the 
big price that Romano was asking for. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he asked for a $10 million licensing agreement. And wow, it was a figure that made me turn red. <laughs> Just asking for it, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, that that was not a deal breaking with Jan Jade. And um, so one thing I also Romano did in that year that we were looking for companies uh, was uh, apply for a patent. Mm -hmm. So he got me a good lawyer. We applied for a patent. And, and so the patent was applied for soon after EGP was formed. And it was granted about a year later. Oh, that's fantastic. And so J&J, &J, it quickly grew at J&J. &J. Uh, you had a small team and then that expanded rapidly, correct? Oh, yeah. I, would say, I mean, uh, the, the whole experience with J&J &J was so great. I mean, it, it was so much fun. They had, they assigned a group of about seven people from Ethicon, one of the companies in J&J &J mm -hmm. in New Jersey. And it was, they were based at Ethicon and uh, on the turnpike. And, uh, and eventually, then they started growing from 7 to 14 to 24. And, mm -hmm. and it went like crazy as, as the project started growing about, let me think, two, maybe, maybe more, more like three or four years later, they had their own building. Wow. They had changed the name to Johnson & Johnson Interventional Systems. Wow. Had yeah, it, it was a, already a large okay. operation at that time. Large operation, so we got our first. I was the uh, principal investigator of the first multi center trial mm -hmm. for Ilya Kateri stenting, and so that's what I said. My life changed dramatically because I was a lot on the road, uh, hotel mm -hmm. rooms, and places that I've never been before, mm -hmm. and uh, even doing my dog and pony show, <laughs> you know, essentially give a lecture, do a case and leave. And that it, it, it was, uh, I would go to Europe and do several places and come back then. I mean, it was great. I, I made a lot of friends and a lot of new people, you know, learned how the Europeans work and, and, uh, it was, it was very interesting. Wow. That's a, that's an incredible story. So a couple of things that I hear just hearing your story, if you'll permit me to Think about what made this so successful besides it being an, obviously a groundbreaking idea, but you had such persistence and tenacity to keep going at it. That's number one. And number two is, is you didn't wait. Whenever an opportunity came, you seemed to take it and you did not wait. When, when you had a chance to talk to Dr. Schatz, you didn't wait until next week or next month. You went to see him the next day when, you know, you would hear of something else. You, you know, Dr. Schultz, you went that, you know, just a little bit later. That to me stands out because that can be the difference maker between being successful and not is do you just, do you just dive in? And when you see an opportunity, do you take it immediately? Well, I mean, yeah, you, you, you're right. You're right. I mean, I have to admit I'm a little obsessive. And, <laughs> and, and, and I think, he, he, I don't know, if, if you want to be flattering, then I say, all right, I, I have the ability to recognize the opportunity. I think is that, you know, I just, you know, I, I am pretty obsessive. I, I want to do things. I'm compulsive and I want to do the things right away. It, everything seems to me a wasted time or wasted opportunity if I don't. So that may be, but remember there, there's a time factor too, you know, where the persistent comes in. I had the idea in 78 and the first product was approved in 1990. Wow. So it's, it's, it's quite a long time, you know, 12 years and a lot of things happen in 12 years. I mean, there were many years of, that seemed that the thing was not moving forward and, uh, and it's just a grinding work. And so, you know, it's, it's not like all these things happen one after the other, you know, in a, in a glamorous no. fashion. Yeah. It, it, I think it often happens that way. When you talk to Dr. Yock and he talks about the rapid exchange catheter, he said for, for, for at least a couple of years, nobody wanted to hear anything about it. He could not get yeah. any, any, any interest. And I think that happens with groundbreaking technologies. And there's this, this time factor that you mentioned that where things just seem to be in stasis for a little while, or maybe, you know, hibernation. And 
but really it's the persistence of maintaining through those periods that leads to new opportunities. Well, I mean, the one thing is I, I, I always tell young people is uh, you, you have to be patient and, and even if you have repeated evidence that this thing is not working and that you are, you know, that something's telling you uh, just drop it and go on mm -hmm. something else. You know, keep going, and eventually one day you have the shiny moment, you know, that mm -hmm. thing that made the difference in the world, you know. Yeah. And and your chance will come. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I, you know, well, th that was such a great story. And let me ask a couple more questions. So what are you working on these days? Are, are you're still involved with medical devices heavily, and w what do you see in the future for endovascular procedures? Well, I, I took my turn into materials, you know, quite a long time ago. You know, when the, remember that I was telling you about the dog and pony show and, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, at some point all that ended and ended pretty quickly, amazingly enough. Uh, it seemed that everybody knew how to use a stent and nobody really needed my, 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 you know, telling them how. In, in, in fact, people were using a stent in very innovative ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... The one thing is, then I saw something that was a problem and and uh, a whole bunch of things that have been neglected for quite a long time have, were not improving and that was materials. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, then I, I said, this is going to be my next cup of tea. I, I love physical chemistry and I develop a, a lab with all the royalties we had at the university. They let me uh, start a materials lab and I do started doing research on materials. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I thought that, you know, I, I started learning things that I haven't worked on before. Mm -hmm. Typical, not in the realm of, uh, of medical knowledge, but rather physical chemistry and, uh, became a sort of a, an amateur physical chemist. Uh, I hired a key physical chemist and a molecular biologist and the three of us, the three stooges were actually, you know, I started doing very fascinating work. And uh, then we started a company in San Antonio that started making metals in vacuum using physical vapor deposition. And mm -hmm. today that company is still here. Well, now we have it in Fremont. Okay. So it's called Vectronics and my son is in charge of it. That's uh, fantastic. So, yeah. yeah that's so fantastic. We are doing super fascinating things. I mean, so, you know, we, I am t t totally... I mean, so of course, I I don't have the strength anymore to <laughs> do all these things that I used to do. So my son has totally taken over, but um, I'm glad to remain as an advisor. The next guard. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, and in life outside of medicine, I'm very fascinated with your, your, your life outside of medicine. It seems like you're into vintage cars, Porsches, and, and vineyards. I, I tell you. It seems like when you make it in the, in the medical device world, you have to have a vineyard. You know, I look at, I look at Dr. Fogarty and, you, and I'm like, that's the dream. That's the dream. So I'm thinking about going out and buying a single vine and putting it on my, my two bedroom porch, just so I can say that I have a, a vineyard, uh, but I have a feeling it's more difficult to grow grapes than, than that. Well, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, I, I highly recommend that you have to have an activity outside Mm -hmm. of your your passion you know at, at work no matter how rewarding it is you, ha you have to do something totally different and uh, so uh, some sort of a hobby is always in, in order when i came to california for the first time you know i used to go on the weekends with my wife my daughter to vineyards and, and wineries and in all this area mm -hmm. so this became my my weekend trip mm -hmm. And I uh, fell in love with the, the California wine country. And after 21 years of San Antonio, mm. my wife decided it was time to go back. And she actually mm. made the, the decision to come back here and get into the wine business. And how's that been? It's uh, Paul Nas Vineyards, correct? And it is. In, it's in Napa. great. And, but I tell you, you, you remember we're talking about persistence? You need mm -hmm. to have persistence <laughs> in the business. Otherwise, you drop it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. This is even, is even slower than medical devices, but it's rewarding. I mean, it's, it's very predictable. All the effort you put into it, you, mm -hmm. you, you get it back, but you know, it's very, very slow. It's multi-generational. in fact, you know, 
What is your, the wines you primarily grow? You're in Napa, I assume, Cabernet, Sauvignon. Yeah, Oscar. Cabernet is king here. Yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, everything, you can do any varietal here because, you know, Napa is an amazing place to to grow grapes. But Cabernet is, 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 is the king here. And how much does a bottle of the Cabernet cost at, at your vineyard? I know well, it's it depends. not. I mean, it's not cheap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh-huh. uh, I think. He's always, yeah, I, I don't follow the prices very well, but, you know, I'm more, I don't know, I mean, 100, 200 bucks. So That's like that. a very good wine. That's too, too rich for, for my blood, I think. It is, uh, yeah, it's a premium wine. Yeah, yeah. do little and high quality. Wow. And, and tell me about the cars. Uh, you mentioned a Porsche 911 earlier was your first Porsche uh, when you went to go see Dr. Schultz. And yes. so tell me, uh, where, is it, you, you clearly have loved Porsches for a long time. Then you had a, a few more resources to buy some higher end Porsches, correct? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it, I've been developing my collection just like anything else. Yeah. And um, I, I, Meticulously. I, <laughs> Meticulously. Yeah. Right. So, you know, at the beginning I was actually collecting anything that mm-hmm was pretty and shiny, but then I discovered Porsches and I thought there was a great uh, history of mm-hmm. uh, meticulous development, mm-hmm. you know, in Porsche. Porsche had a very organic way of developing their cars. And, uh, and I like that. I, I, I remember being at, at a museum in, I think, Aschaffenburg in Germany. Mm-hmm. And I saw for the first time a whole bunch of uh, Porsches from the 50s all the way to the late 70s. And, and side to side, year by year, and uh, and it was pretty impressive, you know, how logical the developments were. Mm-hmm. You know, other companies jumped and leaped and went back and did other things, but Porsche is very methodical, and that's what I like about them. Well, I think it mirrors your your progress with the stent and your career very well. I I understand that. Yes. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. I know uh, you have to go, but thank you. Thank you so, so much for sharing your story and obviously for for the contributions you've made to our field unparalleled. So Great, thank Brian. you so much, Dr. Palmas. I, I, I really appreciate your time. Great, Brian. Great interview. And thank you very much for the questions. 